upper room and welcome to this week's gathering. My name is Carrie and we are so excited that you are joining us this evening. It's so fun seeing everyone's name um, pop on and join us to this service. And so as you see your friends, feel free to say hi, greet one another. I realize that this isn't an in-person service, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't play nice, right? So feel free, say hello, throw out a few emojis. We're so excited to be watching and worshiping with you. We also wanted to make sure that you guys knew that basically every day throughout the week, Upper Room is posting content online. And so be sure to tune into our Instagram, whether it's for our live prayer or worship or these services or our small groups or devos. We are doing so much as a team to make sure that you guys feel um, encouraged and connected during this season. And so do not miss out. Be sure to check our Upper Room um, Instagram for more information on um, what's coming throughout the week. But right now, Greg and Lena are going to lead us in worship, and then Lindsay and the team are going to be bringing such an encouraging message. I can't wait for you guys to hear it.
us a word from him he has fought the raging war of sorrow and when he speaks a whisper shouts with me.
because of what you've done, God, that the power of your spirit now lives within us. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for every day that you've given us, every day that we have healthy, every day that we have alive. God, we thank you that you are in the midst of our lives. God, that you would even care to dwell with us, God. We thank you so much for this service. We thank you for every single person tuning in right now, God. I pray that you would meet their needs. I pray that you would speak to them. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That was some good worship. Amen. Man, I'm all emotional over here. I'm like, how can we go into this after just being in, in God's presence like that and listening to that is so beautiful. And I'm so thankful that you guys are tuning on right now. Um, it's awesome that we still get con to connect just even in this time. And, you know, even throughout this past week, I just saw so many people doing fun activities. I was scrolling on Instagram. I saw people riding bikes and going on hikes cooking really delicious meals, you know, um, just having a good, good time. How many of you enjoyed the 80 degree weather that we just had? Okay. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> like in the rain. Like in the rain. I'm like, I love the sunshine. It was just so good. But I, I think, you know, as I was looking just back on some of the things that I saw this week, um, one of the greatest things and our pictures that I was, you know, coming across was seeing people in our church and, you know, part of our church family go out and reach the community. Yes. You know, um, yes. we obviously, you know, are partnering with City Serve and doing whatever we can to bring the hope of Jesus through meeting their tangible needs. And I saw so many people get meals this week, uh, fruit, sandwiches, like you name it. There was all these different things and resources going out to people and giving them hope in this season um, of setback. You know, a lot of people um, are facing just, you know, hard things right now. They're feeling discouraged. Many people have lost their jobs. Um, many people feel alone and isolated. And I love just seeing how the church is rising up and people are rising up yes, and yes. God's providing, you know, their resources. But you know, God's people are going out and being the hands and feet of Jesus. And um, they're helping people come back from this, you know. And I, I love a good comeback story. Like Me too. <laughs> in movies, when I read books, like I love when um, the underdog is knocked down, you know, but they come back. And all throughout the Bible, I have, you know, read, you know, many powerful um, comeback stories and, and I love them because no matter who you are um, or where you come from, we all face setbacks in life, right? Yeah. You know, we all face some type of issues, whether that be relational issues, financial health, um, whatever it might be, we all have setbacks. But the challenge is how do you um, take your setbacks and come back from them? And what do you do? What is your response during the, those times? And over the next few weeks, we're going to be reading and highlighting people in scripture who faced extreme difficult times. They went through hard seasons, um, you know, had a lot of setbacks in their life, but they didn't allow these setbacks to make them step back. They went forward. Um, they pressed towards the Lord and the Lord set them up for a comeback. They were able to make a comeback. And, you know, I was reading this past week with a few of my friends. We were um, over a Zoom meeting, and we were studying the names of God. And I just love God. You know, he has many names, and he is true to every single one of those. He is faithful. Um, but this, this past week, we were, you know, studying the name El Roy, which means the God who sees. And um, we first find the Lord, you know, with this name mentioned in Genesis, and in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 through 11, it just gives account how God's good world um, and humanity's like repeated rebellion kept messing up God's good world over and over. And, you know, it talks about how God will restore a blessing um, to the world. And we find this answer through Abraham's family. And God makes a covenant with Abraham saying that all nations will be blessed um, through his family. And he promises Abraham that he's going to bless his family specifically and he will multiply his family. And so as he makes this covenant um, with him, we're introduced obviously to his wife, Sarah, because this covenant cannot come to pass. This promise cannot come to pass without her. Um, but we're also introduced to a big problem because Sarah cannot conceive. And so here's Abraham and Sarah, 
and they've been given this promise from the Lord, but they're also facing this huge problem. And so what do you do? So, you know, Sarah, taking matters in her own hands, decides that, you know what, I have an Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and I'm going to give her to my, my husband, um, Abraham, as a surrogate, and we're going to try it this way. We're going to see what we can do. And here she is who, you know, she creates her own plan. And scripture records within that 10 year span that Hagar did conceive. And when she got pregnant, finally, um, she was actually kind of frustrated with Sarah. And we read this like in, in scripture, it says, you know, um, that she became frustrated and she despised Sarah. And so Sarah picking up on these feelings you know, despises her right back <laughs> and kind of gives her a little pushback. <laughs> and, he, and so what happens is, is Hagar decides to flee and run, run away. You know, I'm going to run away from this. I'm going to run away from this problem. I don't know if, you know, who's watching out there, but maybe you're like that when problems or issues or conflict, you know, come up in your life, you don't want to, you know, stay. You want to peace and blessings, like get out of there. Right. And, and this is pretty much what Hagar does. She's like, I'm out, I'm done. And, and scripture says in chapter 16, um, in verse 10, she's in the desert. She's feeling overlooked. Obviously she's frustrated, feeling used. And the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar. And when he comes to her, he says this, he asked her two questions. He says, where have you come from and where are you going? And she responds, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Wow. <sighs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, like, here's a problem. She's frustrated with Sarah. She's despising her. She's having these feelings. She runs away. And what does the Lord tell her? I want you to go back and I want you to submit to her. And you know, she's honest. I'm running away. And he's like, I know you are, you know, and I want you to go back and I want you to submit to her. The angel then, you know, adds, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And the angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child. You will bear a son and you shall name him Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. This is a very powerful scripture found in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And it's interesting that the angel of the Lord asked her those two questions. Where have you come from and where are you going? And I believe it goes to show that the God that we serve who knows the end from the beginning, okay, who brings the good out of the bad, who has your best interest at heart. He sees you and he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly what you're facing. And even though it's hard for us to do at times, when God speaks, we need to obey him, That's right. right? We need to go back and to submit and he will bless us. You know, he'll give you grace to endure and give you the strength to overcome the struggle, the obstacle, the situation that you're facing. And sometimes I really feel like we try to escape um, our present situation and God is saying, stop running from this. I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to teach you a lesson. And I'm telling you, if you just obey me and you submit, if you go back, if you submit to me and what I'm asking you to do, I will teach you. I will use this lesson in your life um, to set you up for the comeback. But we don't see that. But remember, Elroy is the God who sees. God sees, even if we don't see. And, you know, most of us aren't fans of submitting. <laughs> you know, that, especially if it's submitting to someone that you're not a fan of, you know. And so putting ourselves in her shoes, yeah, that can be very difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> but guess what? God tells her to do this. He sends her back to a hard place the place that she didn't want to go, the place that she was running from. But one thing that was so beautiful about Hagar is she obeyed, and you know what? He blessed her. So part of this setup for our comeback requires us, to, you know, to submit. It requires us to fully surrender and submit to the Lord. You know, we read her story as it goes on. We find ourselves in chapter 21 reading, you know, the promise that God spoke to Abraham and Sarah. Lo and behold, it did come to pass. Sarah in her old age, the one who mocked and laughed when God said she was going to become pregnant, all of a sudden conceives and she has a son and they name him Isaac. 
And scripture goes on to say in this chapter that at one point as they're weaning Isaac and he's growing, growing up, Ishmael mocks Isaac and Sarah, mama bear, comes out all protective and is like, no, 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 you know, you are not going to mock my son. Um, and really, she says, I don't want that boy, you know, to co-heir with my son, you know, and, and she saw him as a threat. And so she tells Abraham, I want you to get Hagar and I want you to get your son and I want you to kick them out basically and in, into the wilderness. And so I think about this and Abraham, listen, just like that, the next morning scripture records that he sends them off with some food and some water and bam, they're in the wilderness. And here Hagar is once again with another setback in the wilderness, abandoned, overlooked, hurt, I mean, distraught. Could you imagine, you know, her life? She just basically got her death sentence. I have nothing. I am alone. I have no provider. I have no covering. No child support. No child support. Single mom. Single mom you know, feeling so discouraged. What am I going to do? I'm overlooked once again. And she desperately needs a break. She needs, she needs a comeback. But how, you know, how devastating and discouraging um, she must have felt just looking at her circumstances. How am I ever going to come back from this? What am I going to do? My life is, is no longer the life that I knew. I can no longer go back to that. They don't want me. I'm alone, um, feeling so defeated um, and desperate needing for a break. And she didn't have the power authority to call the shots in her own life. You know, these people, you know, pretty much set her course for her. And she just was like, okay, I have to deal with it. And maybe, like Hagar, you can relate where you feel like, I just need a break. You know, does God see me? Does anyone see me? Does anyone hear me? Maybe even in this time of isolation, you feel completely alone. Um, what happens? Here she is. She basically had to become his wife. She had to do this. She didn't choose this life, but she did it, and she fled. God called her to go back and submit, and look where that got her, wow. you know? Wow. And so I don't know about you. I probably would be frustrated with the Lord. Like, I would be a hot mess, you know? And these are all her setbacks. And she could have done many different things in that moment, but things had gotten really bad because it says in, in this chapter, in chapter 21, that she left her son by a bush because they're in the dry wilderness and they're in the heat. They've ran out of food. They've ran out of water and she cannot bear to see him die. She knows this is it. Like, this is the end of my story. My setback, that's it. I'm done. It is, it is overtaken me. I don't know what to do. And in verse 16, Scripture records that she ran from it at a distance and she sat down and she began to cry out to God. And she cried and it said that she wept very loudly. And she, even though she wept and cried out, she was desperate, but she didn't know if God was gonna come for her or help her. She had no clue. She was unsure if he even saw her that day. Does he even see me? No one else seems to care. No one else seems to listen. No one else seems to think that I matter. No one else thinks I'm valuable. And she's lost in despair. But remember, the God, Elroy, who sees, the one who saw her in chapter 16 is the same one that sees her in chapter 21. Because scripture records that he heard the boy crying and the angel of the Lord appeared to her and he said, Hagar, what's the matter? Do not be afraid. God has heard your boy crying. And he says, look up. And God opened her eyes. And it says when he opened her eyes, all of a sudden she saw a well of water right there. And she went and she filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And that just goes to show us that even in the driest, darkest seasons of our life, when we feel isolated and abandoned and the things that have meant to, the enemy meant to set us back with, God can use over and he's there. He's the God who sees. The truth is no matter, you know, what the enemy has meant to set you back with, no matter what circumstances you are going through, when you cry out to God, and I will keep on repeating because we need to know this is the God that we serve. He is the God who sees us, you know, and, and all we have to do is basically say, God, my option is you. And that's what she did. She had no other option. God, my option is you. My life in this wilderness, you know, uh, it, it's a wilderness without you. I can't make it. I'm going to die. I'm going to, this is, it's dry. I'm weary. I don't know what to do. But she cried out and God saw her. And he sees your situation today. He sees if you've hit rock bottom. Um, but I want to encourage you, 
and I have great friends that are going to encourage you as well, that it's time for a comeback. You know, with Hagar, yeah, this was a setback in her life, but God had destined her for a comeback, but it required her to cry out to him, cry out to the God who sees. You know, this is a God that we serve who never takes his eyes off his people. That's what it goes to show in this story, even in someone who's, was, who seems so insignificant, um, someone who was alone in the desert, no one else cared, no one else seemed to notice, but God noticed. God took, you know, his eyes on her. He never took his eyes off. He never stopped seeing his people. And so part of her journey is, yeah, she had to submit again and again. She also had to surrender. She had to cry out to the Lord, and God began to see her. So just, you know, for a good comeback, you've got to have a good cry out. You know, we got to cry out to God. That's so good. good. I feel like God's always drawn to and compelled by the underdog in the story, like Hagar. And and she reminds me a lot of um, another character in the Bible, um, someone in the middle of the period of the judges, which was this war-torn time. There's wars going on. God is dealing with Israel as a nation, as a whole. And it's like this big scope. And then Right in the middle of this time, we zoom in to this tiny four-chapter uh, book, and um, it's about a widow and her daughter-in-law. And it kind of seems out of place at first, um, but it's the story of Ruth. And in the beginning of the story, we're introduced to Naomi, who um, has her husband, Elimelech, and their two sons. And there's a famine in Israel, so they decide they're going to go down to the neighboring country, Moab, which um, was a pagan nation at the time. And her two sons pick up these Moabite women as wives, and, and they're all married and doing well. But before we even get to verse 6 in the chapter, all of the men die. And we're left with three widows, right? Great. Yeah, (laughs) great. Now what are we going to (laughs) do? So uh, these widows, you know, they're they're all together. Naomi's the the matriarch here. And um, she tells them, there's nothing left for me here. I'm going to go back home. And you should go back home to your mom and dad. I mean, think of it. This is a, a single elderly woman. She has nothing left to give. She even tells them, even if I got lucky enough to score a husband tonight and conceive a child, are you going to wait for him to grow up for yeah. me to give you this son as a husband? Like, no, that's that's not going to happen. So she she just encourages them to go back home to their families. And, um, and one of them does. And the other one stays, and this is Ruth. Ruth is so incredibly loyal to Naomi, and she sticks with her through thick and through thin. And she tells her, I'm sure you've heard this before, um, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Um, Most of the time we hear it in weddings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We hear it at weddings, and it's like this sweet romantic sentiment. But (laughs) when it was originally stated, it was the promise of one destitute, hopeless widow to another. And despite having no future with Naomi, um, they were likely going to live in poverty with no man to provide for them. It was a different day and age where women could not provide for themselves um, with no promise of a future marriage and um, no promise of any future or hope. She still binds herself to Naomi and is committed to following her through. So she goes with her um, up to her hometown in Bethlehem. and, And you have to keep in mind, Ruth is leaving her hometown in Moab. She's leaving everything she knows, her customs, her people, her gods, and she is clinging to everything that Naomi believes and is and is following her and kind of in blind faith. But what I love about Ruth is she gets to Bethlehem and she had every right to sulk and to hide out, but she didn't do that. She didn't throw herself a pity party. She rolled up her sleeves and she's like, okay, let's get to work. Time to find some food. <laughs> so she goes out to this field. But first food. <laughs> for, but first food. If you guys, I know Pastor Lindsay's talked about it before. There's nothing that's going to stop her from getting to her cravings. So I don't know if it was faith or hunger that was driving Ruth. but I can <laughs> she, relate. <laughs> she was excited. So she was motivated, and she goes out to the field of Boaz, who was a nearby relative, but not knowing whose field it was. And she been, begins gleaning from the field. She would go behind the harvesters and pick up the leftovers. And Boaz arrives on the scene. He spots her and starts asking his other workers, what's her story? What can you tell me about her? So he hears all about her faithfulness to Naomi and how she has come all this way with no hope of a future. And he's impressed, not by, 
you know, how good she looks. We don't know what she looked like, but by her character and by her faithfulness to Naomi. And so out of that impression, Boaz approaches her and he says, you know what, why don't you just work in my field? Glean from my field. Don't go anywhere else. You'll be protected here. My workers will look after you. You can have extra provisions of water. And so he was protecting her and making special provisions for her. Um, and he even, uh, he even gave her a meal while she was there and um, sent her home with leftovers, the way to a woman's heart, you know? So uh, this, this book is full of relationship advice. If you've never read it before, uh, it's only four chapters. It's a really good read. Um, so Ruth goes home and she spills the beans to Naomi, tells her everything. And she's going on and on. And, you know, I just imagine her like sitting with her, her legs stuck out, kicking back and forth. And then he gave me the, the rice. And, you know, she's just going on and on. And then she sa- says his name is Boaz. And that's when it clicks with Naomi. And she says, this is one of our family redeemers. And, um, and I know you, you two know this, but for those of you who don't know, there's a, this Jewish legal provision made for deceased family members that if someone were to die in the family, then the closest adult male would tend to the responsibilities of that deceased family member. So that could look like a million different things. It could mean avenging the blood if that deceased family member was murdered. Um, it could wow. mean... Uh, buying up property that they foreclosed on because they lost it. Um, And it could also mean marrying the widow and even producing an heir so that that heir could carry on the name and the inheritance of the deceased family member. So it's a huge responsibility, this this kinsman or family redeemer. Um, And it's it's almost like an extra burden, but that's how important um, their genealogy was to them in carrying on the family name. So when Naomi realizes Boaz has the potential to be their family redeemer, he has the potential to be Ruth's husband, she hatches a plan. And she gives Ruth very specific instructions. And this is where we see um, kind of a turning point in the story. And the responsibility goes to Ruth. And what we learn from her is that a good comeback always requires bold obedience. That's good. So she listens to Naomi. She does exactly as she's told. And it's a very delicate situation. There's legal proceedings that have to happen in order for him to redeem their family. And it's also just, it's awkward. Like, she's essentially asking him for a proposal. Like, how does that conversation oh, start? Yeah. <laughs> it's That's very interesting. Very bold, very bold, you know. And here she is. She's like, hey, you know. <laughs> and all my baggage, we're here for the taking. Um, and if that wasn't awkward enough, the instructions that Naomi gives her to go to him while he's full of food, while he's sleepy, and uncover his feet and lay down beside him. By his feet? By his feet. Now that is a strange little call there. <laughs> it's weird. And I've been looking to see if there's some, you know, cultural explanation we don't know about. If there is, I haven't found it yet. God I- bless her. <laughs> I know, not everyone's a fan of feet, so... Absolutely not. She was committed. So she goes and she follows Naomi's instructions. She does exactly what she's told. And um, we know it's also kind of a little weird then because Boaz himself is startled by her. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and like, who's there? And, um, and she, she tells him, it's me, your servant Ruth. And um, they begin this dialogue. And we won't get into all of the turns from that point on, but Boaz agrees. And he's going to do what it takes to be their kinsman redeemer. And it's this beautiful story. Um, I even love that Naomi says, when Ruth comes home and tells her what happened, Naomi says, he will not rest until the matter is settled. That is a man of God right there. He will not rest until the matter wow. is settled. And so... Um, it's this really sweet story. They end up getting married, and then they have a son together. And it's, it's really nice, but if you're looking at the Bible from a, a bigger scope, if you're looking at it as one cohesive narrative, which it is, we're left with this question of, like, why? Why is this here? Why in the middle of this period of the judges, right before the monarchy is introduced, um, what's the point of this story? And, and not to mention, it's also really strange because God never speaks directly in the story. He's not... Um, visible by any means. Yeah. He's not speaking wow. to them. We, we don't really hear from God in the story. And wow. Wow. he almost goes undetected. It's very ordinary. It's very everyday. And um, by the end of the book, the author of Ruth finally reveals why this story matters so much. And that is because Ruth is the great grandmother of King David. Wow. 
And we know that David's line, from David's line, came the lineage of Jesus. And by Ruth's faithful obedience, she made herself available to God for his redemptive purposes on the earth. And although God was silent, he was 100% present. He was working in the ordinary. He was working in the everyday moments. And Ruth is the perfect example um, of how God weaves his divine providence with our simple obedience. And I love this comeback story because um, Ruth got her happy ending. You know, she has a husband and got a son. But um, that really wasn't the bottom line. That really wasn't the point of the story. Uh, The story was about so much more. And God wrote a better ending for her story than she could have ever planned for herself. Better than, um, you know, what she had planned with her first husband. Better than living in Moab. And she had been grafted into the eternal family of God. Talk about a gift. And not only was she grafted into his eternal family, but she was given the honor of being an ancestor of Jesus. And I just think about... You know, sometimes when we go through times of loss and of grief, it's really easy to hang on to our pain. We were kind of talking about this before. We can feel entitled to hang on to our pain, to hang on to our our bitterness. Like, this happened to me. I'm going to wear my scars proud. But Ruth didn't make that choice. She Instead, she decided um, to be bold and to be obedient. You know, she could have easily said, this whole God thing isn't working out for me. I'm going to go back to my pagan gods. But she didn't. She she persevered. She was bold. She was obedient. Right. And um, and when I think we go through those, these dry seasons or these wilderness experiences like we've been discussing, we have that choice to be obedient or to be bitter. Yeah. And even Naomi, her mother-in-law, when she came back from Moab, she said, I left full and came back empty. And sometimes I believe God has to empty out our lives in order for us to receive the fullness of what he has next for us. And, you know, maybe like you're home and you're feeling emptied out in this season. Maybe there was a future you felt was promised to you, whether it was a relationship that didn't work out or plans to travel the world or a child or, or something that you felt like this is a promise from God. This is something that he has for me. And I just want to encourage you that in this time where you might feel emptied out or something that is a legitimate blessing and good thing that has been taken away. God wants to redeem not just your sin of your past, but he wants to redeem those wilderness experiences. He wants to redeem those empty seasons where you've lost everything because he has a better story written for you than what you could ever plan for yourself. And um, I just love how, how her lineage goes on to continue to declare the good works of the Lord, even in the life of, of David. Yeah, and it's interesting. And that's a crazy journey of her submitting and, and just giving her awe. Uh, and God just did a comeback story in that. It reminds me a little bit of David. In uh, David's story, what I like about David is that, yes, he had a lot of victory and a lot of success. But there was points in David's life where he, he was an ordinary man. He made some mistakes. And of, like all of us have a purpose and a calling in our life, but we know David's success and um, he defeated Goliath and he did all this, but there was a moment in David's life where he messed up. Yeah. And it was, everyone knows the story of when he messed up with Bathsheba. And one of the, one of the things that I find fascinating about David's story um, is when he messed up with Bathsheba, uh, there was a couple of things that were going on. Number one, he should have been at war. So he was isolated kind of like quarantine kind of us like yeah. right secondly he was alone and third he was bored and i really believe sometimes when those things are combined uh we begin to do some stupid stuff yeah and, say that again uh when you're bored when isolated. you're bored uh isolated and alone sometimes we we, we give into our temptations or emotions and we make some dumb mistakes That's and so that was that was david there and so he made some mistakes in this in his journey um and what i love about god and you were saying and you were saying that god sees and he saw, yes, his mistake, but God did something about it. He saw him in his sin, but he sent a prophet to go speak to him. And as he sent a prophet, he told him a story. And David heard the story uh, and recognized that he messed up. He recognized that, oh, man, I've sinned. And if you read Psalms 51, he just confesses his sins. Like, I've messed up. Mm-hmm. I've sinned against you, oh God, against you alone. You know, cleanse me. Don't take away your spirit away from me. And he repents. And what I love about David is that he could have, just denied it, said, that's not me. He could have just said, uh, ignored it, but he repented in his heart. Yeah. And so I, I really believe that a good comeback story requires repentance. Mm. Um, because he, here's, um, 
in Psalms 51.10 says, David says this. Uh, this is a psalm that he wrote about this whole situation. It's, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me out from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit away from me. And then later on he says, uh, the, uh, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken or repented heart, O God. And so I, I love this story because David messed up. God, he saw where he was at. He sent help. David repented. Um, he was honest. And, and because of that, God transformed that bad situation and literally transformed it and made it into something good. Um, and in other words, it's out of this horrible situation, God turned it around and something great came out of it. And one of the great comebacks of this is that, of course, it was Bathsheba that he's messed up with. But Bathsheba did three amazing things in, in, in um in history, number one, she uh, saved the kingdom. Uh, in, in First Kings, she was able to save the kingdom because David's son wanted to take over. Uh, the second thing she did is that she gave birth uh, to one of the greatest kings, Solomon, wise, rich. There, he was so rich that there was uh, so much uh, gold that silver was of little or no value. Uh, and the third one was that the descendants of the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one from Abraham, um, uh, was born through, uh, uh, through Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. And that, that is beautiful how God took something that David messed up and said, hey, I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to create something beautiful out of that. And so, but the first thing that we have to do is that we have to come, to, in order to have a great comeback, we have to come back to God come back to his presence, come back to our first love, come back to our first joy. And for a lot of us, I, I don't know where you're at, but none of us are perfect. I wish I was as perfect as uh, some of these characters, but I'm not. I relate a little more to Heard David. <laughs> I relate more to David, not in the sense of the holy righteous one, but man, I've made some mistakes in my life and I'll probably make some mistakes here and there. But knowing that we have to come back to God, come back to that first love, come back to him. And when, when, when we do that, God begins to restore us because he does not reject that. He right. takes that, he does something beautiful and, and elevates it. And that's even our stories in our life, the gospel, what he did on the cross, yeah. right? That's he true. takes a messed up, uh, us who are messed up and, and he who is righteous and we are who are just sinful. And he flips it around and yeah. he becomes sin and we become the righteousness of God. And that's just a, the greatest comeback ever. Yeah. Like he takes us and makes us beautiful and righteous. And it's not through our actions, but it's believing and having faith in Jesus. So it's, it's, it's a great comeback. So. Amen. Preach. Come on. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah. amen? That is so good. You know, within all of these stories, it is so encouraging to read that no matter what you are facing, um, no matter how negative it looks today, um, you're going to come back. When you begin to cry out to God, when you have bold obedience or when you repent, whatever situation you find yourself in and whatever has made you in life, you know, experience setbacks, when you cry out to God, um, when you, you know, obey, are obedient to what he's asking you to do. And when you repent, um, God sees, God hears. And I truly believe in my spirit, like we're looking at how the whole world is pretty much on pause right now. Like yeah. crazy. we're in lockdown, we're isolated, all these different things. But I do believe that God is stirring a comeback spirit where yes. we're going to come out of this. Yes. We're going to rise above this. Yes. And I believe, you know, yes. we were just talking last night how God does want to pour revival out and not just on one generation or one group of people, but all generations. And I'm excited because I believe we're going to be a part of that. And I believe that even in this time of waiting, um, we should be actively expecting God to do something great. Like we are going to have a comeback like no other. You know, we, we read about past revivals and read about great things and miracles, but I believe that God is setting his people up for a phenomenal comeback. And if we could just get, you know, like Hagar or like Ruth or like David, you know, with what we're facing in our setbacks and say, God, I need you. Like I need you right Right now and begin to cry out to him or maybe just take the time to be obedient and listen God what are you saying to me right now in this season or maybe it's like going back to him coming back to the Lord and having a repentive heart then hey um, God can work with that God can do something so powerful and he wants to set you up you know for a comeback, but it's the enemy who lies and whispers to us and says, you're never going to change. You're always going to be defeated. You're always going to be in the wilderness. You're never going to get a husband. You know, you're always going to be filthy and dirty and your, your past reputation. But God, the God who sees, says something different. His promises are yes and amen, and his word does not return void. And I believe he says, this is a season for a comeback. I'm setting you up for a comeback. And what often looks like, you know, 
it, as far as setbacks in our life, it, you know, makes us feel like we need to take a step back. But I want to encourage you, run to Jesus. Like Eman, you know, encourages us to do, go back to your first love. Come back to God. He's calling you today, you know, and it doesn't matter if you've been away from him for 20 years or two minutes. Like just right now, wherever you're at, just say, God, I need you. I surrender to you because he's the God who sees. He's been with you through it all. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is right there with you. And I truly believe in God's kingdom, you know, Failure is not final if you truly believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came back from the dead, you know, after he died for us, for our sins. Three days later, he just rose out of that grave. We studied that last week with the resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus made a comeback. And I love that. He came back to set us up for our comeback. That's the God that we serve in Romans 8, 11. And I just want to close with this. It says, if the same spirit who, you know, raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And Paul writes, yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want to just challenge you, take a hold of that word, that you are an overcomer and a conqueror through Christ Jesus. He loves you. You're not barely surviving these setbacks. You're going to overcome these setbacks. You're going to make a comeback. And the same God who did it for Hagar, the same God who did it for Ruth, the same God who did it for David is the same God who sees you right where you're at. And he wants to do it for you. And so we're going to have just the next few moments, we're going to take um, time, you know, and just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Like I said, I don't know where you're at right now, but I do know that we're in a season of a comeback season, that God wants to, you know, raise his children up to make a great comeback, and he wants to use you to be a part of it. He wants to take your setbacks and use them and, and allow the, his power to come into your life and to set you up for the greatest comeback personally and as a whole. You know, as, as a family of, of the body of Christ as a whole, I believe he wants us to um, come back together. And so I believe that God has a way of reclaiming, regathering, restoring, renewing, and he has a plan, and God has a plan. He has a plan for you. And I pray today that you will take hold of that because we're in a comeback season, and he loves you so much. So as we just worship for a little bit, um, you know, maybe a minute or two, I just want you to reflect on this word and begin to ask the Lord, God, what area in my life, what setback have I experienced are you going to use for my comeback? we are so thankful that you see us. We are thankful, Lord, that you sent your son to die for us. And God, we um, confess that we are sinners and that we need you. We needed you to do that saving work. And so we ask that you um, would, in fact, meet us. We are crying out to you. Um, like the message invited us to do so. And so we surrender our hearts to you. We love you. We trust you. And we pray that you would help us to do that more in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Like I said, be sure to connect with us pretty much every day throughout the week. We'll see you.